Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to be uh, listening to Dr. Uh, Chris Loisel this morning. He's a radiation oncologist here at Swedish um, in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Loisel um, studied chemical engineering initially in, uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and then entered the world of finance where he worked in JP Morgan for a little while, then uh, decided to go into medicine and went to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. Um, following that, uh, did his training here and now in, uh, in uh, Washington, in uh, the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and trained in radiation oncology. Since training, he actually has been working um, here at Swedish for the past 11 years um, in with the radiation oncology team, and we're going to hear about that. He has numerous uh, peer-reviewed articles. Uh, he has a family of three kids uh, with in, in his free time. He plays tennis, and I recently learned that we share uh the love for surfing um and uh yeah thank you dr loisel uh thanks for the introduction Alan. uh let me share my screen here here otherwise from you oh, today we're good. going to talk about uh the radio radiobiology and clinical care of skull base and cns tumors and over the last few years there have been increasing publications with titles such as this, Fractionated Stereotactic Radiation Therapy for Intact Brain Metastases. And the articles generally say that this approach, known as FSRT, it, it works great. And they, they usually say there, there aren't many studies on this topic, but it works great. And, you know, we should use this and we should study it more. And I thought I'd dive down and try to explain uh, what uh, FSRT is and why it's effective uh, on a radiobiology level. And I I'd like to go over some cases and I'd like to uh, present a, a, a tale of two MRI scans and, and look at these uh, MR images of two different patients and, and decide by the end of this talk, which of these patients uh, is a candidate for FSRT, uh, or neither, or, or both. Our objectives today uh, are to understand the linear quadratic and linear quadratic linear models for cell survival with radiation treatment, determine appropriate patients for FSRT, uh, and to introduce advancements for neuroindications for stereotactic irradiation. Um, the Tumor Institute at Swedish Medical Center has been here in Seattle since 1932. This is a, a picture of the building in the region of, of Broadway and Madison uh, back in the, the early 1930s. And this is actually my, my practice group's 90th anniversary this year, uh, practicing radiation oncology here in the Seattle area. Uh, we were the, the first large group uh, to deliver therapeutic radiation west of the Mississippi, uh, going back almost a century ago. And when we look back at how radiation treatment was delivered uh, in the mid 20th century, we can think about those technologies in the context of photographs such as this, looking at these giant linear accelerators and thinking about the manners in which this treatment was made safe, this, this treatment was made safe with fractionation. Um, normal tissue tolerance, limited dose escalation. And so the delivery of radiation treatment was made safe by doing treatments over approximately 30, 40, 50 days. So a month, two months of treatment. And this is akin to Nowadays, going to a tanning booth is the best analogy that I can think of, where if you say go to Touch of Maui uh, and you're interested in a tan, and I, I've never been to uh, a tanning salon, I guess they're referred to as, uh, but if you go and you say, I, I need a tan, they don't say, okay, you know, we're going to do it. Here's your hour. They don't do it in one hour because they're afraid that they'll burn your skin. They have you return for 
three treatments a week over a period of six or eight weeks. So this is, this is the concept of fractionation. So they're breaking up that, in that case, ultraviolet radiation delivery over many treatments to make it somewhat safer. Now, on the, on the flip side of that, um, a few decades later, the gamma knife was invented and eventually became a mainstream treatment. And this is, this is the total opposite approach. This is image guided high dose radiation treatment to very small volumes delivered in a single treatment. Now, so on the, on the one hand, you have the advent of fractionated radiation treatment, large target volumes with fractionation protecting normal structures and the micro environment around targeted tumors. I mean, this was like lighting many candlesticks over long periods of time. And, and then on the flip side, you have the advent of the gamma knife where you're treating very small volumes, high dose per single fraction. And, and you're actually introducing severe micro environment damage. Uh, so you, you have two mechanisms. You have cellular kill, but then you have damage of the stromal support, vascular tissues in and around the target. And you can only get away with this when you're treating, again, very small volumes. Otherwise, the treatment just would not be tolerated. So as an example of a high-dose targeted gamma knife, this patient who underwent a left VIM thalamotomy for treatment of essential tremor, and you can see the lesion defect here on the T1 coronal quite well. Uh, this patient is coming in for treatment of a contralateral uh, side. Uh, here you can see the gamma knife uh, isodose target here on the right side. Uh, but so highly destructive lesion, um, completely destructive. So when we think about what is happening with fractionated radiation treatment delivery, we look at what is called the linear quadratic model. This is a, a conventional and well understood radiobiologic model on a log linear plot looking at cell survival versus dose. And what you see here is at lower doses, you see here a linear component to the curve, and then you see this bend where the quadratic function uh, comes into play. Now, what is happening with stereotactic radiosurgery? There is a lot of cell kill, but because of the vascular and stromal damage, disruption of the microenvironment, we know that the linear quadratic model shown here is inappropriate to model high dose per fraction effects in radiosurgery. And there are you have a multitude of articles written on these topics. So what is happening with fractionated stereotactic radiation? What's happening when we're delivering these modern era, larger doses per fraction to significantly larger volumes than used to be possible? Well, we're accomplishing cell kill to a point and we're minimizing vascular and stromal damage in comparison to stereotactic radiosurgery. But as one looks at the model, they see that it's actually somewhat different. So here is again, a plot of <clears throat> cell survival versus dose. This is a log linear plot. And you can see that there's a linear component here that where early on at low doses, you have this linear cell kill, then you can see that you kind of have this bend in the curve. And so you have linear quadratic cell kill in this conventional dose range, one, two, three gray, you know, which was where patients were treated in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you know, probably all the way through the year 2000, this is where radiation oncology lived. And then, out here, you know, what's happening out here in the range of four, five, six gray, you have this linear quadratic and then again, linear model. So we know that 
radiation dose that you have increasing cell kill exponentially as you hit a certain dose, but then it seems to become linear again. So this here is the external beam radiotherapy dose range. And you know, over here, here's this gamma knife dose range. It, it's off the charts. This stuff isn't really even modeled in conventional, in conventional uh, radiobiology. And so, you know, so, so here, this is where we lived you know, through essentially the 20th century. So we live down in this range where patients are getting two months of two gray per day. And then <clears throat> over here, we have what was happening with gamma knife, which is really off the charts in terms of cell kill because of the contribution of microenvironment damage. So, <clears throat> you know, look at this there. I, I'm half joking here, but you know, the, this gap here is so big, you can drive a bus through it. You know, what about delivering six, seven gray uh, in a single fraction? Does anyone do this? You know, where, where, do, where does this come into play? So again, so you have to think about this historically. Think about mid 20th century, people coming for two months of treatment, large volume targets, low dose per fraction, and then over on the other side, gamma knife, super high dose per fraction. And then in the middle, in the middle is this intermediate volume, um, high dose per fraction treatment. So, you know, candlesticks, nuclear reaction. And, and, you know, now we just generally have this intermediate, uh, kind of a bonfire in between these, these two ranges. You know, how do we, how do we explain or, or how do we, um, characterize this. Well, this is what FSRT is. This is fractionated stereotactic radiation therapy. So this is operating in this intermediate dose range of delivering three, four, five fractions in this range of four to seven gray. So as the, ther as the therapeutic window of dose per day narrows, we're, we're stopping that dose escalation and coming back uh, in a separate treatment. So this is the fractionated stereotactic radiation therapy dose range. Now, so for whom is this appropriate? Um, you know, when we look back at publications, predominantly in, from institutions that were treating patients with gamma knife, this is a large series from Pittsburgh. This is a great paper. Um, this is long follow-up, five to 10 years of follow-up. But what's interesting is that the median tumor volume for studies like this was only five cc's. They weren't really treating larger, larger tumors. And what they saw as they tried to treat larger tumors is that they saw higher rates of edema, particularly for, for convexity or parenchymal tumors, not so much for basal meningiomas, but when treating hemispheric meningiomas of significantly larger volumes, they were seeing much higher, higher rates of edema. And the risk factors were higher marginal doses, tumor size greater than three centimeters or the presence of pretreatment edema. So as we look at these two cases, would either of these cases be excellent candidates for single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery? You know, these are right on the cusp of three centimeter tumors and, you know, would these patients be good candidates? You know, people always ask me, what is the size cutoff for doing single fraction or fractionated stereotactic radiation? And, you know, it's really the, the least important factor and the more important factors for say surgery versus fractionated stereotactic radiation or for smaller tumors, single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery is whether or not the patient is having symptoms, what their age and comorbidities are, what their cancer control is otherwise, their performance status and radiographically, what's the extent of edema that is potentially causing motor, sensory, speech, gait, cognitive problems or seizures. So 
Of these two cases, the patient on the left has a long history, more than 10 years of controlled gastroesophageal cancer. He presented with this brain metastasis with motor difficulties and seizures. This is not a good candidate for really any upfront radiation therapy approach. This patient ended up going for surgery. And we later on are planning on treating the surgical cavity. Whereas this patient on the right, this is a patient who presented upfront with widely metastatic disease. Um, the patient needed to initiate systemic therapy as soon as possible. This was an incidentally found tumor on staging studies. He had no symptoms whatsoever. So because of the, the lesion size though, we took a fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy approach. Here's the treatment plan. <clears throat> we treat six to seven gray over a total of five fractions. This tumor had cystic and solid components. We treated the entirety of the cyst wall and this patient did phenomenally well. Here's another patient who presented in March of 2020. And I saw this woman who was otherwise in good health after she presented with right-sided facial pain and blurry vision. And you can imagine cranial nerves three, four, and six being involved, causing extraocular motor deficits. And you can imagine involvement of the trigeminal nerve causing her symptoms similar to trigeminal neuralgia. That's a very, very interesting case in that it has all of this anterior extension. When I, when I first saw this patient, I thought perhaps this was some sort of skull base extension of a head and neck or minor salivary primary, perhaps adenoid cystic carcinoma. I actually saw her a few months after this initial study was done and, and repeated this scan which look at these axial views. I mean, look at this. I would characterize as explosive growth pushing into the medial temporal lobe. That um, I, I no longer thought this was adenoid cystic carcinoma, given the typically more indolent nature of that disease. Um, but maybe it was some sort of malignant schwannoma. Maybe it was metastatic aggressive squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Maybe it was some sort of super aggressive meningioma or other dural based process extending outward through the skull base foramina, uh, tracking along the trigeminal nerve. Anyways, had this biopsy, this turned out to be melanoma. Um, you know, perhaps some sort of very unusual dural based primary melanoma or more likely some sort of metastatic melanoma process. But given the explosive growth and the extent of disease, this patient isn't really a great surgical candidate. And I mean, anatomically, not a great surgical candidate either. Um, but th this is a great candidate for fractionated stereotactic radiation. It's such a large volume that we would not think about treating in a single fraction. Also, you know, with the extent, extent of disease, such a large volume would, would set her up for post-treatment edema, even though this is a, a base of skull location. So we treated this patient 35 gray and five fractions to the 55% isodose line. So all of this volume getting approximately 40 gray to the margin in five fractions and, you know, very, very large volume. Here, here's how she did over a period of about six, five, six months, four or five, six months. So, I mean, look at this disease regression here with the hypofractionated approach. You would never see this kind of response with conventionally fractionated radiation. And I think many would be very reticent to take on an approach of single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery given the volume. Interestingly too, she had a phenomenal clinical response. She was left with some post-treatment numbness, but her shock-like electrical stabbing, trigeminal neuralgia-like pain on the right side completely dissipated and her extraocular movements normalized such that she no longer had blurry vision. Um, 
Interestingly, she was left with some jaw misalignment that developed a few months after treatment. And recall that the trigeminal nerve does, in addition to being responsible for the sensory function for which we commonly think about, uh, it does innervate the muscles of mastication uh, for motor function. And she was left with some denervation atrophy through the pterygoids and master muscle that showed up as, as enhancement in those regions by MRI following treatment. But otherwise she has excellent disease control. She, she did go on adjuvant ipilimumab and nivolumab following treatment for a year and is continuing on uh, single agent immunotherapy in, in a second year. Um, aside, it's a good question as to whether you know, that should be continued or discontinued, but it's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. Here, here's the axial view. Here's what we accomplished with a fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy approach. Uh, it's really a great result. Um, you know, very large skull based meningiomas. Patient initially went for surgery, um, had a number of post operative complications, had some ongoing double vision issues. Uh, we treated this large meningioma to 2,750 centigrade of the 76% isodose line. Again, a patient for whom single fraction stereotactic radiosurgery, you know, would set this patient up for risks related to edema. I'd particularly worry about, you know, edema pushing on the medial temporal lobe and the risk for seizures uh, or the risk for cranial neuropathy. Um, years later, so six years later, here, here's what this looks like. You can see that the effacement of the brainstem uh, has, has very much regressed. You can see that there's a much more normal contour of the lateral cavernous sinus and all of this skull-based disease has generally consolidated. Um, an excellent result. Here's another extensive skull-based meningioma. Um, this is a, a young woman who presented with a headache. I think this was initially really fully asymptomatic. I don't think this was causing her headache but she had minimal radiographic progression over time and was quite young. And so we treated this with fractionated stereotactic radiation, FSRT, five fractions, 2,750 centigrade, prescribed to approximately the 60% isodose line. Now, you know, here's, here's what this looked like a couple months later, and this is actually a, a study done outside and the interpreting radiologist said, you know, interval surgical debulking you know, which I, I sort of, you know, wear as a badge of honor as a radiation oncologist, because this patient didn't have any surgery at all. She had high dose image guided radiation treatment of this fairly bulky tumor. And she had, you know, an amazing response. Again, this is not a response that you see with conventionally fractionated radiation. And we all would have been reticent to treat this with single fraction, given the fairly severe effacement of the brainstem. But look how that's decompressed through a radiation approach. That's amazing. She, she actually was fully asymptomatic before treatment and remained fully asymptomatic for months following treatment and is still being followed, continues to have um, more regression of this tumor, not quite as, as, as phenomenal of a, a regression as we saw initially, uh, but still it's continuing to regress probably by a millimeter a year for a, a few more years. Um, it, you know, the outside radiologist never, never noticed that there was no evidence of craniotomy, uh, which, you know, just, you know, I have to make that comment. Uh, if she'd had a craniotomy, I think there would have been more evidence, but uh, still a uh, badge of honor for, for radiation treatment. All of these patients, all of these, all of these patients with these fairly bulky tumors, in the absence of a lot of pretreatment edema and symptoms, are excellent patients for for fractionated stereotactic radiation treatment. Uh, and these are the patients in whom uh, uh, we consider this treatment. And you know, which is really a new paradigm. I mean, it, it, this is just you know something you know things you know that have been only around for 10 to 15 to 20 years are, are really very new and contemporary in, in the world of medicine. Uh, and these are really new and contemporary things. Um, let's uh, change gears a little bit and talk about some 
um, advancements for neuroindications for stereotactic radiation uh, that we in our group have been uh, working on uh, over the past two years. Um, this is a, a phantom uh, patient uh, that we use uh, for a lot of quality assurance and testing procedures on the cyber knife. Uh, and indeed, uh, this uh, patient is wearing the gamma knife head frame. Uh, and um, uh, we didn't have a neurosurgeon put this head frame on. Uh, uh, we did this ourselves, our, our physicists uh, and I, um, working on our surgical competence as well, I guess. But uh, we have devised an apparatus for fixed head frame treatment uh, using uh, the uh, gamma knife head frame. And uh, this uh, something, this is an image that I, I think we were the first one to generate it. This is a, um, a, a robotic radiosurgical targeting image from uh, our cyber knife uh, for a patient uh, who, uh, well, for a, a phantom patient uh, who, for whom we were experimenting uh, with treatment uh, using uh, the CyberKnife platform. And we are interested in this for uh, a number of reasons, uh, but the new uh, stereotactic platform uh, known as the CyberKnife made by Accuray has increased angles and degrees of freedom. So you can see in blue here, we have Whereas we used to only have the green angles of attack, we are substantially increasing the uh, coverage angles using the CyberKnife platform with newer robots because they're increasingly able to get underneath the table and are able to drop in front of the patient. So historically, the stereotactic hemisphere which was initially established by Gamma Knife was the superior hemisphere above the head, right? So remember the, the Gamma Knife helmets, right? So you'd have these angles above the head. The modern Gamma Knife is just a band around the head. They actually don't have any angles from the vertex. And of course there are no angles coming in through the chin. So with the new robotic platforms, we're able to drop below the table. We have the full degrees of freedom coming up over the head, around the face. So we have this increased targeting degrees of freedom. We also have the capability with modern robotic radiosurgery to um, use multi-leaf collimation to give us any shape of the beam that we would like. So historically, radiosurgery collimators were just circular cones and we could adjust the diameter with Gamma Knife. We could go down to four millimeters or up to in the modern platform, 16 millimeters. But now we're able to really highly modulate with robotic radiosurgery, this beam shape which gives us the capability to treat larger targets with fractionated stereotactic radiation therapy with extreme conformality. Um, and we're doing this more and more. We're treating larger tumors in this intermediate dose range more and more with definitive treatment over multiple fractions. This is a really helpful tool for designing these treatment plans. As well with the modern robotic platforms, the couch has uh, been developed so that weight limits are significantly increased. We have more and more patients who are uh, above the conventional 250 to 300 pound table limit. We have more degrees of freedom to manage how we move these patients. A lot of the modern couches come in sitting to laying or chiropractic like tables where you can get on standing up and then be lowered down. And with the robotic platforms in partnerships with Brain Lab and with some really impressive software innovations, we are able to treat multiple metastatic targets using robotic radiosurgery in an equivalent manner as to how we would traditionally do this with the gamma knife. 
Uh, so some amazing advancements on the software side. So we've been working a lot with Accuray and um, uh, we've been um, using our uh, uh, phantom patients in the head frame and analyzing how this would work for uh, functional cases where we are delivering uh, 135 gray single fraction to make a lesion because that's the highest dose that we treat with radiosurgery. And uh, it is, um, these are our trickiest patients for uh, the single reason that they're, they're moving more than other patients are. So patients with essential tremor often have head tremor and they have uh, a need for more extreme mobilization, immobilization. Uh, and we're, um, we, we've tested this out and using the head frame to uh, deliver a single dose image guided, super high dose radiation uh, in these functional patients uh, and can now achieve gamma knife uh, equivalent doses uh, with the robotic radio surgery platform that we uh, uh, previously have been uh, really only able to achieve with uh, the gamma knife. And that this is really um, uh, helpful to us um, because the platform is just so versatile. So, you know, we have the capability now with these robotic platforms to treat larger tumors like that patient with the extensive skull-based metastatic melanoma with a fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy approach. But now we have the same capability to treat this patient in a fixed head frame, doing single dose, super high single dose image-guided stereotactic radiation. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to speak to you today from uh, my office here at Swedish Cherry Hill. This is our team. We have a great team here, Bob Meyer, Sandy Vermeulen, uh, Daniel Landis are my partners here. Um, and I think all of you know how to reach us anytime. Um, but uh, this is my uh, personal contact information. And I welcome you to always reach out on any of these topics or about any patients uh, as I can be uh, of help. Um, there are a few of you uh, live uh, on the presentation today, and if I can answer any questions, uh, I'm happy to do so. Chris, thanks so much. It's Cameron. Um, I really appreciate you coming and speaking to us today, and, and uh, those are some pretty amazing uh, cases that you're showing there. Um, you're obviously touching on one of the things you and I had talked about earlier, the gamma knife uh, versus cyber knife. And, you know, I think the uh, degrees of freedom and the, ro the robotic uh, uh, capabilities that you're talking about to me seem, um, you know, like huge advances. Can yeah. you go on just a little bit about um, the decision-making that, that you're facing in terms of, uh, replacing one of your units, gamma knife versus cyber knife, and, and what the, the real cases are that really are, are you know, perhaps more limiting uh, with, with gamma knife versus the, the advances you're seeing in cyber knife. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because so much of our practice has moved to this, you know, this intermediate fractionated treatment where we're treating these larger volume tumors where we use the cyber knife, you know, almost exclusively. Um, you know, the, the gamma knife through, you know, for the last few decades has, I think, been the gold standard in stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, but economically, it's, it's somewhat of a challenge because dealing with the cobalt uh, is really expensive. And we're, we're somewhat limited to uh, treating these smaller volume single fraction cases with the gamma knife. 
And we have the flexibility with the CyberKnife to do both, and increasingly so with the development work that we've done with Accuray. So the, the constraint of the CyberKnife used to be that we didn't have the capability for delivering fixed head frame, very high dose stereotactic radiation in a single fraction. But again, with the development work we've done with Accuray, we've been able to close that gap so that now that's, uh, that's a reality for us. Um, also, with the, on the software side, the algorithms that allow us to treat, for example, multiple metastases uh, on the CyberKnife have jumped far past the software capabilities of, of GammaKnife. Um, you know, I think that Accuray is very motivated to, you know, really ensure that the CyberKnife is a highly relevant tool in the world of neuro-oncology, uh, you know, going forward the next 10, 15, 20 years. And I think that the advancements in the Gamma Knife have been far fewer, kind of both on the hardware and on the software side. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a challenge for us to use the Gamma Knife in an adaptive manner for you know, some of these trickier cases, some of these larger volume cases. Um, also in areas like vascular, for example, Accuray has partnered with Brain Lab and we're, we're able now to integrate uh, 3D Angio into our targeting process. Whereas with the Gamma Knife, we're still stuck in this 2D Angio era. And when, you know, we compare the cases side by side, the, the 3D targeting is just so much more conformal. Our, you know, intermediate dose volumes are so much more compact. I think that these patients probably will really have a lower risk of symptomatic radionecrosis. So, you know, on, on pretty much every metric, uh, the robotic radio surgical platform like CyberKnife is, um, moving far ahead from the more conventional fixed head frame cobalt platform like, like Gamma Knife. For a lot of us who, you know, who uh, have familiarity with a technique, uh, a device, uh, a, a procedure, it's very hard to move away from something that has worked for us that we've had good results with this, you know, in our, our it's, it's our comfort zone that we, uh, are um, sometimes reluctant to leave. Are, are there any specific cases that you can think of where, where Gamma Knife still has a, a meaningful advantage over the cyber knife? Yeah, so the, the answer to that is I really can't. Um, uh, you know, the, the extreme example for us where, you know, so to date, we have only been willing to do thalamotomy where we're treating 135 gray single fraction, making approximately a four millimeter lesion in the thalamus. To date, that is the last frontier where Gamma Knife excels over, over Cyber Knife. So for us, that is the, the you know, highest precision, highest dose case example, where to date we have only done treatment with Gamma Knife. Uh, and through our development efforts, we have, um, you know, brought the capability of CyberKnife at least on par and potentially better given the additional degrees of freedom of attack angles. Oh, you're on mute, Cameron, but I can, I can see you talking. Uh, yes, uh, Alon, I see that uh, you have your hand mm -hmm. up, I think. Um I have two questions, if I may. First, um, where do the Lineat systems fall uh, in between this uh, Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife, um, yeah. as so many use those? And that's my first question. My second question is, um, do you think that the fractionated um, radiation, uh, the stereotactic radiation, uh, is here to replace the proton beam for the skull-based tumors? Can it, should it? Yeah, the problem with, there are a lot of problems with protons and stereotactic radiation. 
and skull base regions. So protons have a lot of difficulty being modeled with air interfaces. So I think that is maybe one of the biggest challenges that is faced for high dose image guided proton treatment. Um, because essentially if you're moving through sinuses and that's a dynamic environment, let's say patients develop some sort of congestion in the sinuses, you, you, it's very difficult to modulate that beam because that beam is dropping its Bragg peak at such a specific depth. So if you have un, unknown air depth with this beam, you might be moving that Bragg peak inadvertently. Um, we've actually seen a number of patients with unexpected brainstem radionecrosis who had cavernous sinus region or medial temporal lobe tumors irradiated with protons. And the, the physics around this problem are not completely understood. Why there's this endpoint range uncertainty with protons um, uh, in the region of the skull base is not fully understood. There's also a lot of lateral scatter with protons. So you have the Bragg peak at depth, but you don't have it laterally. So there's a lot of lateral scatter and there's also a lot of entrance dose. So I think that until you have, you know, intensity modulated proton therapy where you're using the cross fired approach. I mean, remember stereotactic radio surgery is like lighting a leaf on fire with a magnifying glass, right? So you're taking in that example, you're taking ultraviolet rays from the sun and with a magnifying glass, bringing those rays to a focal point. And if you know, you're know you millimeters away or millimeters too close to the focal point, you have no significant energy deposition. It's right at the focal point. That's what we're doing with tools like the gamma knife or the cyber knife. We're taking hundreds of high energy but low intensity beams and bringing them all to a single focal point. You do have some exit dose, but that dose is so low per beam that it's biologically not significant. Now, whereas with protons, you're bringing one large volume beam in, you have a lot of lateral scatter, you have range uncertainty at the Bragg peak, and you have entrance dose. So it is hard to dose escalate to the tumor using protons. So until you figure out how to use the cross-fired proton approach, intensity modulated radiation, until you can take 10, 50, 100, 150, 200 proton beams and bring them together like we do with stereotactic radiation. Protons, I think, will always be an inferior treatment. And I think that we're probably, you know, 70 years away from being able to do that. In regard to yeah, protons regard are still protons are still the gold standard for many of these skull based tumors to the point that people travel all over to these few centers that still have that. You think that's outdated? Well, it depends. So um, you know, I think that with I think that so that proton technology has been around for a long time. And, and, you know, I, 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 it's, it's almost in there with the early slide that I had where I was comparing fractionated radiation with gamma knife, you know, protons are right in there with fractionated radiation. And we don't have a lot of evidence of the FSRT approach and its effectiveness for treating say clival chordoma. I mean, I think that that is an indication where people really travel long distances and stay long time, stay for long, um, a long amount of time at a center offering protons. But, you know, I, I think that the, there is some, uh, um, I, I think the literature around that is okay. And I think that is, you know, an okay treatment. Um, but if you want to really think about the physics of dose escalation, I think that in the FSRT era, that we'll see more and more interest in those approaches for treating um, skull-based indications like clival cordoma. I see. 
Uh, back to so where you know where do you, we stand with LINAC based stereotactic radiation? Well, you know in our program we've made the commitment to go with dedicated stereotactic radio surgical platforms like the Gamma Knife and Cyber Knife because the dose distributions are superior. You you cannot get quite the equivalent level of dose with dedicated um, highly collimated non coplanar beams that you can with gamma knife and cyber knife with a linear accelerator. Um, there are many retrofits. There are dedicated stereotactic cones. There are, you know, table and linear accelerator configurations, which improve on that. Um, but I, I don't think that they um, have nearly closed the gap for dedicated platforms like the cyber knife. But I will tell you that one way that you can, um, that, that where there's compensation for that is in using the fractionated stereotactic approach, because, you know, as you know, so the, the model for, for cell kill is linear quadratic linear. And so as you are getting again into that linear range, it's not linear quadratic. It's not like the more, 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 more dose you get in the better because you start to have more and more damage to the normal microenvironment. So as you're again, hitting that linear component of cell kill, that's where you want to truncate your dose. And that's in the range of, you know, between five and 10 gray per fraction, depending on the radiobiology of the target. Um, so um, I think that with linear accelerator platforms that there's some benefit in taking this fractionated approach rather than trying to do stereotactic radio surgery where you're doing all of the um, radiation treatment in a single dose because your conformality is less, right? Your, your dose seepage around the area with a LINAC platform uh, is going to be inferior. You have more dose getting out into this penumbra region of non-tumor or non-target anatomy. Uh, and so you can take advantage of the radiobiology of fractionation um, with that and um, I, I think achieve better outcomes. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Mark, I see you've had your hand up patiently there. I think he, um, he, he just put in the chat, um, Cam. Uh, okay, um, great. That All right. I just have a quick, quick question, um, Chris. Uh, that was a great presentation. What's, what's new for spine metastasis? Um, and what's your guys' position on, you know, a lot of these patients, you know, the recommendation is still that they get the 30 gray standard radiation. Yeah, um, greater times 10. What do you think about that, Chris? <laughs> Um, you know, I think that, you know, we're increasingly able to do stereotactic radiation to larger volume tumors uh, with a fractionated approach. And I actually think that for many tumors that um, the radiobiology favors a fractionated approach. And I didn't really get too much into that mm -hmm. here today. But I think that whereas, you know, Mark Bilski and Josh Yamada um, were doing a lot of single fraction um, to doses of, uh, you know, 20, 24 gray single fraction, I think that um, we're able to, you, you know, you're just somewhat dose limited in terms of the volume that, that they were treating. And I think increasingly uh, we're able to treat larger volumes with this fractionated approach. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the problem with 300 times 10 is that, you know, these patients are living long. So I didn't show this in the talk either, but, you know, you have patients with like lumbosacral disease and you're doing external beam radiation and you are, treating these large volumes of L3 through the sacrum into the pelvis. And, 
you know, interestingly, these patients are living longer and they're getting more and more and more in terms of systemic therapy. And I think it's interesting, and this is coming up more and more, but, you know, those larger volume treatments can sometimes set up patients for, um, you, you know, 40% of the bone marrow is in the pelvis, right? And a lot of it is in the axial spine. And the more and more of those areas that you treat, the, the more and more you set those patients up for some degree of bone marrow insufficiency. And th this is really anecdotal, but this is just kind of, you know, me thinking out loud in response to your question. Um, you know, patients are living longer. They're getting more and more systemic therapies. Some patients are getting more and more chemotherapies. I mean, we have patients now who are on their 839th cycle of cytotoxic chemotherapy. I mean, can you believe that? I mean, these are patients who are living, you know, decades with metastatic disease who, who are, have literally gotten, you know, almost a thousand cycles of chemotherapy. I mean, that is tough on your bone marrow. Then more and more, we're implementing stereotactic radiation to sites of oligometastatic progression. And I think that if you're, if you think about this, you, you can't really patch together these large external beam radiation therapy fields and a thousand cycles of chemotherapy and have, you know, great functioning bone marrow. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that for any given patient at any one given site. And I think that for more radio um, responsive histologies like breast cancer and prostate cancer that are, you know, fairly common that, you know, very often 10 fraction external beam radiation, simple large fields is okay. But as you start to think about that over, you know, now patients living many years getting treated to multiple sites, I think that um, the stereotactic radiation techniques um, where you're not treating these large, these very large volumes are, you know, potentially more valuable. Yeah. I mean, I think Chris, I think the biology is really important um, and uh, it's, it's interesting how we've always kind of had this shotgun approach for metastatic disease um, and not really considered the tumor biology as, as a um, important part of like the treatment plan. But I think that's changed a lot, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, in the future, like you said, I mean, it's tough for us because we see patients who had, who now are like four or five years out, they've had standard radiation, They've had fractionated treatment and now they've got a sacral fracture right. with, with instability um, and uh, severe neurologic compromise. And you're having to operate in this, you know, and I think in, in my experience is if you can avoid standard radiation, it just makes it so much easier um, for tissue, for healing. And I, I feel like it just, it's a setup. I mean, for infection, fixation, I mean, all, all the different things that we have to deal with. So, yeah, you know, I mean, Rod, so this is right in line with, you know, where I was going in terms of the thought process, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, <clears throat> six months around the treatment that matters. Right. I mean, so somebody comes in metastatic prostate cancer to, you know, the iliac wing and L3, right? And they, they get this huge external beam field, you know, from L2 down through the sacrum and half the pelvis, right? And guess what? It's going to work. The cancer will, you know, probably be controlled at least for a period of time. Maybe it'll be yeah. well controlled. And, you know, when that's done in conjunction with modern ADT and other, other systemic therapies, but, you know, it's two, three years later when, the patient may, you know, need some surgical intervention. The patient has, you know, progressive disease adjacent to this where, 
you know, you've kind of burned that bridge a bit. I mean, I, I feel the same way about, you know, we often have an argument about treating 12 lesions in the brain with an insurance company where they want us to do whole brain radiation. Right. I, I mean, you know, in women with breast cancer who have brain metastases, many of them live many, many, many years. I mean, sometimes decades. And whole brain radiation therapy is not the answer for, you know, a total of, uh, you know, a total of, you know, eight cc's of metastatic disease, right? Um, so, I mean, we, we constantly are fighting that in similar battles. Yeah. All right. Um, that was a great presentation, Chris. I really appreciate you coming this morning. I don't see that there's any other questions. I want to just, again, thank you for coming. Thanks, uh, Corey and the folks at SSF for setting this up. And uh, the CME credit, uh, if you want to claim that, you can see on the screen now, Corey's put that up. So, uh, again, thanks very Super. much. And yeah, thanks for having me thanks. as a guest and for uh, uh, hosting the event. Okay. Great job, Chris. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now.